book of Jonah is just about that we are never, never alone. You know, the story of the book of Jonah isn't just about a man who disobeyed God. Then he faced a storm. He was thrown into deep sea, swallowed up by huge fish. Then he repented in the belly of the fish. Then was allowed to live again. If the story was this story, as amazing as it is, But if this story is all about this story, then I'm not sure whether it really belongs in the Bible. Yes, the story of Jonah is uh, about a man who was on the run. But the book of Jonah, this is a book of Jonah. It's not the story of Jonah. We tend to focus too much on the story of Jonah. But we need to focus on the book of Jonah, the author of this story. We often forget that we only need to focus on the lifestyle, what Jonah had done as if he's our hero in a way he is. But the essence of studying our Bible is to see the heart of our Lord. What was he trying to say through the book of Jonah? The book of Jonah is a story about how our God is revealing what he will do, how he will come to save us. How we'll come to know when the Savior appears. How do we know he is the one? The book of Jonah is about the prophecy of what is to come. Not only our Lord Jesus, coming of our Lord Jesus, for us all, when we are in tough spot, what is there to come? In the belly of fish, the challenge and sufferings that we go through, is this the end? The book of Jonah is about what is to come. The book depicts the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ at the same time for us. When we are going through the trials, that's not the end of the world. There is greater things yet to come. The story of the book of Jonah is therefore is a story of the heart of God. We need to understand the heart, the author, when he was writing. What was he trying to tell us through the story of Jonah? More fundamentally, it is about how God loves us. It's about how God loving us, not, it's not just limited to his chosen ones. Remember last week when we talked about the chapter one? Up until that time, up until the story of Jonah, the focus of all the godly men and women in the Bible was on the chosen ones, the Hebrews. How God came to save them from the bondage during the Moses days, from Abraham to Moses, to how he, God, rescued all the chosen ones. When the book of Jonah, God now begins focused on not the chosen ones, the Gentiles, non-believers, sinners like you and I. It is a powerful Story. It's a powerful testament from God saying, I love all of you, not just the chosen ones. It is about God who is foretelling us what is and who is to come. He reveals the coming of Jesus Christ very clearly, 
We spoke of that last week. We will continue to do that today. God reveals how his son will be thrown into the grave. Jonah was thrown into the deep sea to die. Jonah was in the belly of a fish three days and three nights. And he lived. Our Lord Jesus Christ was thrown into the grave. And he was there three days and three nights. And he lived. Amazing thing is, Jesus died. He was in the belly of the tomb for three days and three nights. But you know what? His body never decayed. Jonah, in the belly of this huge fish, he did not get digested. He lived. It's powerful parallel a story of Jesus as foretold by the story of Jonah. The story of the book of Jonah is about God who provides. He is ready to scoop us up, always with us. Jonah was thrown into the storm water to die. It was very clear he was thrown to die. Yet in verse 117, last verse of chapter 1, God provided a great fish. God provided great fish. Great fish wasn't happened to be there. It was all along following, chasing after Jonah. Right now, I know God is chasing after you in a good way. He hasn't given up on you yet. We may rebel. We may abandon him. God always is with you, following you. He's ready to take you on. What appears to be fearful, monster, big fish, but that's lifesaver. It's your savior. Challenges and troubles that you may go through, maybe, not maybe, will be your life-saving rescue mission by God. As we discussed last week, the essence of a Bible is this. All the stories of the Old Testament points to New Testament. And the story of New Testament is about creation of both heaven and earth and his love for his people, and the prophecy of what is to come. And thus, the Jonah clearly, clearly depict that. Let me remind you again. I know some of you are challenged by relationship, finances. Oh yeah, I know some of you are really in deep trouble financially. I know some of you can't even go to education right now, can't pay for the tuition. May feel like God has abandoned you. But you know, big fish is there for you right now. It's chasing after you to rescue you. You think it's going to come and swallow you up. No, no, no. From the book of Jonah. Big fish, although as scary as it may be, it's really the lifesaver. I can relate to that. I know most of you know the story. I was in the hospital for five months waiting for heart transplant surgery. To me, that was the valley of the shadow of death. To me, that was like being in the belly of big fish. Oh, John, I was only there for three and... Nights and three days. I was there for five months. Even during that period of time, God had 
that big fish, the scary one, to save me. Initially, he swallowed me up. But the fact that he swallowed me up, or allowed fish to swallow me up, was the safe savior for me. Now, chapter one, God clearly spelled out his mission. His mission for you and I just as well. God basically said, Jonah, through you, I intend to save the people of sinners, the people of Nineveh. They are wicked. That represents people like us, the non-believers of God, the Gentiles, and people like you and I, the sinners. And that is very much, as I said, in parallel to what he intend to do with his son to save all of us, to save the entire world, save the lost. Now that was chapter one, that God is with us all the time. Regardless of circumstances or situation that we may be in. And most of us, because we are challenged, we're sinners, we have trials, we have sufferings, we have pains. But be comforted that he's got this big, huge fish swimming with you right now, ready to rescue you, to rescue us. In chapter 2, now, in the book of John, there's only four chapters. So today we're going to focus on chapter 2. Chapter 2 is about God preparing us all the time with his mission. He's preparing us. He's saying, I love you so much, and I want you to be part of my family, part of my mission. And it shows, like, how do we prepare for his mission? Do I need to go to military and learn how to run, learn how to shoot? Do I need to join some athletic club and uh, learn how to run and learn how to endure more? That's how we think. But chapter 2 is totally and completely dedicated to Jonah's prayer. The prayer is mighty, mighty powerful. It's what our God is trying to show to us. You can have it all if you learn to communicate with our Lord through prayer. Praying is the ultimate preparation connecting with God so that through prayer, God will do all the work for you. All we need to do is be thankful. And the heart of, and have a heart of repentance, knowing what we have done. And Commit to redirecting focus of our life. That was the summary of Jonah's prayer. How does God prepare us? He will give us storms, challenges, fears, sufferings, and pain. Well, can we live life without it? Why can't our life be just joyful, good news in each and every day? I don't think we want that because Adam and Eve certainly didn't want that. 
even though they had it. There's something to be learned from that. The reason why God gives us the challenges and the storms and sufferings and pains in our life is so that we can focus, focus, and focus on God. That we are less and less distracted. You know, when things are going so well for me, there is no way that I can focus on God. I will be the first one to admit to you. As you're now working on four different sort of uh, things, uh, in a business, uh, 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 engineering, architecture, design firm that I'm managing, I've got a church to manage, and I've got seminary, then I'm biblical seminary that I'm vice chair of, so I'm very involved with that. Then I have this, uh, you know, the government uh, duties that I need to do. If everything is doing great, I don't think I can focus on anything. Because we just become, I'm so good. Look what I am achieving. Look all the recognition. My neck and my shoulder gets more stiffer, saying that I did it all. But you know, when you are challenged with the the pains and sufferings, and then you realize, I need somebody else to go along. And you begin to depend on God. And then when you begin to depend on God, that's when the humility comes in. When the humility comes in, God says, I like you. Now you're ready. You are prepared. Now I can use you. When your neck is so stiff, you're not ready yet to do my mission. And even you try to do it, it will not be seen good in the eyes of not only the Lord, but out in the eyes of many people. You know who I'm talking about. That stiff neck guy. I'm not going to follow him. You can't find favor from God that way. God gives us the challenges, trials, and sufferings for your good, for our good. Those are good things. Think of that as uh, God watering our plants, you and I, so it can grow. That's a good thing. And Jonah demonstrated that in his prayer. And you can see it even in James Chapter 1, verse 2 and 4, referring to the challenge that we face. In James 1, 2, 4 says, Consider it pure joy. How can you consider the challenges being swallowed up by big fish a joy? My brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that testing of your faith develops perseverance, verse 4 perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If you look at this picture, mature and complete and ready to go, just think about athletes. That's what they strive to do. They go through amazing physical agony of pain for that physical maturity, and hopefully mental maturity as well, so that they can go lacking nothing to go and compete in the race. And God gave, through his trials, a boldness and a bravery to march into that wicked city of Nineveh. How does God prepare us? Know that God may, and most likely, give you trials so you can focus on him. That he will give you insight 
wisdom. So you can do your task, God's task, more effectively, hopefully in shorter time. How does he prepare? Through prayers. Prayer to connect with God in a very profound and deep way. Even today, I try to pray the best I can. But you know, it's not the, in the same level of intensity when I was in the, the belly of shadow of death of hospital intensive care unit. I know during that five months, my prayer was focused. I know during that period of time, my connection with God was deep and profound compared even today. But you know what? The insight, the relationship that I gained during that period of time, how I was able to thank him for being in the hospital for my five months, and how I ended up depending my wrongdoings of the past. And how I was able to redirect my focus on him. I thanked him for that. And that insights, that feeling, I still have it to carry me on. It reminds me of, I remember, God revealed himself. God is real. Even today, I can, when I'm struggling, I go back and draw energy from that time that I had a wonderful, amazing relationship with God. And I pray that you will do the same. If you feel that you have not experienced that, pray. Give me that insight. Give me the wisdom. Give me the boldness and bravery that you gave to Jonah through the, his challenge. But don't let me swallow up a big fish. But maybe just a little bit. Something that can, I can endure. But Jonah's was that it didn't matter whether it was swallowed by fish or not because he knew 100% he'll be rescued. That's the kind of faith he had. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the exact same thing. He was going through the ultimate sacrifice. Far worse than being swallowed up by big fish. He was on the cross, persecuted, crucified. But he knew 100% he will be saved. Meaning, he will be resurrected. If we can live life like that, the challenge we face, 100% I know I will be saved. It's not the kind of prayer you go to God and says, help me to save. I know I will be saved. That's the kind of prayer that Jonah prayed. Talking about being prepared in the hospital. Talking about God preparing Jonah in the belly of a big fish. Where he demonstrated total confidence in God, that he will rescue him. To us, Jonah may have been in hopeless situation. How can you have a hope when you are swallowed up by big fish? And if you really think about it, if you really think about it, are you thinking, guys, right now? If you really think about it, Jonah may have been in the best place He could possibly be it. That place was where he was under the care and protection of loving God. Can you tell yourself, remind yourself, that when you are going through tough times right now, and I am so, it's so difficult, cries and tears are 
just flowing my, my face and all the time and just, I don't know how I'm going to go through the life. And you said, this is perhaps the best time, a best place for me to be in. Because I know right now, God is focusing on me, that there is this whale, even though it may look scary, but if you think about whale, big fish, as a rescuer, you begin to learn to comfort. This is the best place for me. I am so, so close to God. So if you look at the prayer of Jonah, his prayer is so unique. It's worth studying. That's why it is dedicated to entire chapter 2. Nothing else is in that chapter. From beginning to the end is his prayer. You know what is so unique, interesting, profound about his prayer? It's not the way you and I will pray. We've been taught so often, which we should. Our prayer usually includes petition, request. God, give me this. God, save me this. Take me out of this bondage. That's how we pray. And we should pray that. But to encourage you, there's want you to understand how Jonah prayed. In Jonah's prayer, he prayed all the things that we all pray, except the one thing he did not include in his prayer. And that's request and that's a petition. He did not petition God. He did not request of anything to God. His prayer is already in past tense. Do you know that, guys? It's done. It has been answered. You have already listened to my prayer. It will be done. One of the reasons this past tense prayer is in this book is because God is also telling us at the same time the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ will happen the same way. Jonah's prayer had no petition, no request. He had a thanksgiving. From verse 2 to 6, had a thanksgiving. Had a contrition, the, 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 the repentance, verse 7 and 8, and rededication in verse 9. So let's examine the word of God in chapter 2. Inside a fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. Just think about it, guys. This poor man is in the belly of big fish, about to be digested. And he prays. And call God still his God. I tell you guys, I did not do that. Maybe that's why God kept me there for five months. For two weeks? No, 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 no. I did not call my God, my God. I rebelled him. How can you, God, put me in this spot? I went like this much short of saying, how dare you? My father gave his life to you. How can you treat my father that way? He gave his life serving a leprosy colony, and he's now expecting some, some rewards. Hey, son, you did good. I have a favor upon you. But instead, you're giving his very own son, allow him to be swollen up by this big fish called hospital intensive care unit where I cannot even get out. But Jonah, his state of mind was different. He puts everything in a past tense. It's already done. I already know God's going to rescue me. Verse 2, in my distress, I call to the Lord, and he answered me, past tense. It didn't say, you will answer me. I hope you come to rescue me and answer me. No, no. He answered me. That is us. 
powerful, guys. And you could see his prayer resembling the phrases from Psalm. The word, in my distress, it comes from Psalm 20, verse 1 through 5. This, I want to read it to you, which is up there, because I read this many, many, many times. Because I was desperately seeking the victory, desperately seeking God reaching out to me, rescuing me. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. Jonah says, in my distress, I'm still in the belly, but you already already answered me. Psalm, may the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he remember all the sacrifice and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. We will shout for joy when you are victorious and will lift up our manners in the name of our Lord. May Lord grant all your requests. It's okay to request. But Jonah was a step above. I don't need to request because I already know it's already been answered. Man, if I have somebody like that around me, we can move the world. We can do a lot of good things. Think about the, the camaraderie. Think about the uh, things that we can do together. Think about how as a church, how we can go forward and do things together for the name of the Lord. He answered, past tense. This is having a total and complete confidence in our God. That God is with Jonah. That God is preparing for that great task. There is no sign of doubt here. Now we say, well, we're humans. You know, you know, we can't really not have a doubt. Well, we understand that. But this is the reason why this particular book points toward New Testament, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ our Lord had no doubt about his death on the cross, that he will be rescued, that he will be resurrected. From the depth of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Past tense, you listened my prayer. You know, it takes a totally different state of mind to be able to pray God in a past tense, as if it's already done. In the depth of the grave, I call for help. King James says, out of the belly of hell, living Bible, from the depth of death. New King James, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. Sheol means unseen world. Death. Some theologians are actually saying that because of the word Shuar in Hebrew, it was used. Jonah may actually have died in the belly, just like Jesus. But we're not sure yet. If you look at its coloration as to how Jesus will come to save and rescue, how he actually ends up dying and then gets resurrected, if you follow that, the word Shuar means he may have actually died. And was resurrected, got to live again. The point is, that may be important, but it's not that important right now for you and I to understand the power behind the state of mind of Jonah, his confidence in our God.
And if you go down and look at verse 6. To the roots of mountains sank down, the earth beneath barred me forever. But you broke my life up from the pit. Man, this guy is still in the pit. He's still in the belly of the fish. Again, it's past tense. You brought me out of the pit. You brought my life up from pit. Maybe he was dead and life came back up. Again, it's not that critical for us to understand. That's for theologians to deal with. There's a past tense. Total confidence that he will be rescued. That's the heart of thanksgiving. When you are thankful for something that happened to you when others may say, that's too bad, but you are thankful for the challenge you're going through, you already know that you will be lifted up again. That's a total heart of confidence in God. Knowing that God is in control and that God is preparing something for you and I. Verse 8, it's just amazing. Verse 8, verse eight what does verse 8 says? Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the what? Grace. Can you say that? Oh, next time I'll try to make it a little bigger so you can read. Forfeit the grace that could be theirs. God did not use the word favor here. It's Old Testament. Whenever God talks about the grace that we're talking about, the gift that God talks about, word favor, but in the case, God used word grace. It's a free gift. You could have all this, the greatness of the virtue of God. But you believe some other idols, whatever they may be, you're actually forfeiting it. You're actually forgetting. You're giving up the grace that you could be all yours. So the introduction of the word grace is shown here. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 9, But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. His state of mind was thanking God for the trial he's going through. And I, my testimony is towards the end of my five months in the hospital, I was thankful. And will sacrifice to you. Jonah said, I will sacrifice. I will go to that wicked land of Nineveh. They may kill me. They will persecute me for sure, but I'll go anyways. Jesus said, I will sacrifice my life, my body, and I will bow that I will make it good. And salvation comes from the Lord. The grace comes from the Lord. Salvation comes from the Lord talking about deliverance of all his people. The potential deliverance of all the people. Not only the people of Nineveh. Nineveh just purely represents the wicked people like us. The sinners like us. And that Jesus Christ will rise from the depths of grave and give us the salvation. And so in verse 10, 
the last one. This is the only one that it was not part of his prayer. But the conclusion of the matter, and the Lord commanded fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. You know what that means? That means it's just resurrection. He lives again. You and I can live again. A new life, newly dedicated life, newly focused life, newly new, dire- new directed life is what this is all about. Jonah always knew that God was with him all the time. And through the prayer in chapter 2, he knew that God was preparing him to take on God's mission of giving salvation to the wicked people. To, that's to all of us. Not only did God knew that he was going to rescue Jonah, even Jonah knew that he was going to be rescued. That's a message for us to be completely and totally comforted in the belief that you have. We have already witnessed what they have not witnessed in the Old Testament. We have already witnessed our Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. We are the fortunate ones to have witnessed that what was told and through the book of Jonah came to conclusion 2,000 years ago through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have more confidence, let's say more evidence to know and to believe that when we are suffering, when we are in challenge, to be able to speak about God in the past tense, it is done. Guess what? What Jesus did at the last breath, it is done. It is finished. Let me relate this to a, a simple little story to wrap all this one up. I was reading some book or something and I saw this article and story and it really touched me. And because we can live like this. You say, wow, that's a story of Jonah. That's like godly man. And like, well, that's not like me. And I can get away with a lesser or whatever. But we have in us to believe this. There was a little girl was flying in the air. A lot of passengers. All of a sudden, plane meets this big, big storm, lightning and thunder. As if it's going to just hit the airplane and a little big, huge plane with like being tossed in the air like whatever, like balloons or whatever. It's all over the place. And all the passengers were scared. They became pale and blue. Somebody in a prayer mode. They didn't know what to do. They're scared. And there was one man who noticed there was a little young girl. She was just had no tension, not scared, sitting there very comfortably. When the plane is being tossed up and down, she would just close her eyes. When it flies and steady, and then she'll open the book up and she'll begin to read again. When the plane is buffets in the air once again, they should close their eyes. And when the plane landed safely, and this man was so curious how this young little girl stayed so calm when all these adults and others were scared to death. So he approached this little girl at the terminal and said, Hey, little girl, how did you remain so calm? In that stormy, stormy airplane. And she smiled and she replied, Sir, my daddy is the pilot. He is taking me home. We all have ability. We all have a quality to feel this way. If you can own it, have a state of mind of Jonah. My God is the pilot. I may be on earth, I may be in 
water. I may be in the belly of a big fish. It don't matter. He's taking me home. And God will be so pleased with your state of mind. He would want to save you, rescue even faster. That's what we desire, don't we? So let's have complete and total faith in him and prepare ourselves with with a prayer to know that God is always with us and God is right now preparing for you for his amazing mission. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you so, so much. 